And here we have Aaron Perry, an author of Environmental and Conservative Matters from Why on Earth, an environmental-focused nonprofit who will be educating us today on some really great ideas on how we can take little actions that individually and collectively can make a meaningful impact to protect and preserve our plant. Without further ado, Aaron, take it away. Thank you, Tomas. Hello, everybody. It's nice to visit with you today. I want to uh, first off thank Leah Leon and Austin March for putting this together, and of course, Tomas for coordinating on the uh, technology front. And uh, just to give you a, a really brief little bit of information on me and my background, um, I'll mention that I'm also a father. Uh, Tomas mentioned that I'm an author, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm an, an executive advisor. Um, I write fiction and nonfiction, more nonfiction than fiction thus far. Um, my adult kids are uh, in school. My daughter's in medical school. My son's in architecture and environmental design school. As an entrepreneur, I've launched companies in the renewable energy, the regenerative agriculture, and organic and natural foods spaces, and have worked as CEO and CFO. And as an executive advisor, I work with a variety of teams engaged in what we like to call, broadly speaking, the regeneration renaissance. Uh, my background includes uh, being a Gallatin scholar at NYU and then doing graduate work at the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, which included uh, sustainable economic development and environmental policy, along with philosophy, literature and history. So without further ado, I'll jump into our presentation. And uh, as Tomas mentioned, uh, today I'm going to focus on simple actions for Earth Day and every day that you can take and uh, hopefully incorporate into your day-to-day -day lifestyle going forward. Again, thanks to Wilson and Sonsini for hosting me. Covered the background and qualifications. Uh, happy to you know, provide even more info. By the way, we're going to leave some time at the end here for questions and answers. Uh, so if you have any, uh, please hold those till the end if you would. And so we're going to focus in on simple recommendations for stewardship, regeneration, and sustainability on the one hand that are good for our planet, for our ecosystems upon which we all depend. And also many of these recommendations are going to additionally enhance our own health, prosperity, well-being, and thriving. And the Why on Earth community, by the way, I should mention, is a action-oriented educational nonprofit that I founded and run as executive director. And our foundation is from my book, Why on Earth. And this little mandala here you see on your screen is the interconnected links between the 33 chapters. And as you'll see it going forward, uh, much of the simple strategies and opportunities we have to take in our daily lives are going to connect to a lot of other meaningful strategies and opportunities for enhanced health and sustainability. So this theme of interconnectedness is foundational to getting into an examination and inquiry and exploration of the personal choices and habits that we each have the opportunity to continue to cultivate and evolve. Uh, of course, one of my favorite uh, uh authorities on all of this is somebody you might recognize here's yoda saying try not do and and when it comes to some of the behavior changes that uh, we'll be inviting you to consider um yeah there's some wisdom in this you know i i remember hearing that uh, uh george lucas was called uh his favorite student by joseph campbell who had of course studied traditions and cultures from all around the world so although Yoda is a fictional character, I think brings some very real uh, wisdom and advice to us. And um, Alexander here, who created the Alexander Method of Acting, has a perfect quote for what we'll be getting into here. He says, people do not decide their futures, they decide their habits, and their habits decide their futures. And one of the things I've been exploring uh, for years now is, is how each of us has the opportunity to make these simple decisions day in and day out that not only enhance our own quality of life and personal experiences, but are also very much in service to the broader stewardship, regeneration and sustainability of our shared planet. And so with that interconnectedness community comes to mind and also Oikos, and you may be familiar with this term. Uh, yeah, it's not just a, a yogurt brand, although a clever 
uh, name for a yogurt company. This is actually a Greek term, and it's the term from which we get both the word ecology and economy. And oikos means home and has implicit in it a, a meaning of community and connectedness. So back in ancient Greece, we would have referred to our house structure as an oikos, and we would have also referred to the front room where we would receive guests and neighbors as the oikos of the house. So this is a, a really important sort of etymological background to keep in mind as we're getting into these daily recommendations. I'm just setting some context here before diving into the specifics and rest assured, we've got a lot of uh, specifics to share with you today. So yes, our home, our oikos, this notion of home can of course extend well beyond our house our neighborhood, our community, perhaps at the city or state where we live and all the way out to the planet at least. But for most of us, planetary awareness of home is, uh, is sufficient in terms of our opportunities to be in service and to enhance health, wellness and stewardship uh, along with our friends, our colleagues and our neighbors. Uh, just a really brief uh, outline of the framework that we like to think in terms of food, movement, nature, soil, and well-being on the one hand, and stewardship, regeneration, energy, agriculture, choice as in consumer demand, etc., and of course, kindness. So uh, perhaps a little humor. Um, when we're thinking about all of these opportunities, not only uh, are they specifically addressing certain systemic risks that we're facing. And, and folks might think of things like extreme uh, weather as a result of uh, destabilizing climate. Folks might think of water. Uh, many of us, especially in the Western part of the country are uh, dealing with some very deep systemic challenges around water. And so this cartoon here uh, brings a little light humor to the situation. And somebody in the audience at a climate summit is saying, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing after the speaker shares that the strategies being uh, laid out would not only uh, help with the climate situation, but would also add to energy independence, preserving rainforest, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, healthy children, and so on. So we've uh, put together a set of recommendations in 10 categories. And again, just want to thank both Austin and Leah for the uh, creative back and forth we've had over the last several days to curate this presentation for you all. Hopefully it's helpful and meaningful for you. Um, the first category is food and beverage choices. The second is indoor environments. The third is clothing, textiles, and laundry. The fourth is soil connection. The fifth, packaging and paper choices. The sixth, uh, nature connection and movement. The seventh is transportation. You'd probably expect to see power usage, which is number eight, as well as water usage and stewardship, number nine here. And then community stewardship is, is our 10th category. So, with food and beverage choices, uh, we've got several recommendations that are probably going to be helpful in terms of enhancing your own health, wellness, and quality of life, while also very much having a positive impact in some of the global challenges and systemic risks that we're facing. Um, so first is more organic choices. And look, with, with these opportunities, this isn't necessarily uh, about uh, black and white uh, delineations and certainly is probably not helpful to think in terms of shame or blame or, uh, oh gosh, I'm not doing good enough or whatever it might be. And really the invitation is to take a look at our own lives and examine and determine where we each might be able to do a little bit more, a little bit better and make some of those incremental changes. And over time, as we get in the habit and habituate ourselves to making those incremental changes, lo and behold, uh, we can very much create a, a much different outcome for ourselves and for our world in the aggregate. So more organic choices uh, is quite important. And same with more regenerative choices, especially for those of us who do eat meat. The idea is that less quantity meat and higher quality meat raised in, with regenerative practices is one of the ways we can have a very positive impact on the world. Of course, many of us are probably uh, have already chosen to live uh, vegan or eat with a vegan uh, lifestyle, that's fine too. And 
The third is, is for shorthand, show, know, and grow. And this is our simple framework for encouraging folks to show uh, the regenerative and organic practices by third party certification. There are a lot of folks out there um, with the USDA organic standards, the uh, Regenerative Organic Alliance, which now has a regenerative organic certification and others. Um, no is encouraging us to literally know some of the farmers and growers from whom we're getting part of our food. And we can do this through farmers markets. Many of us live in places where we can go out and connect to a local farmer and get to know that person and really support their efforts in uh, enhancing the food resilience in our communities and helping to mitigate the food desert issues that we see in many of our communities. And of course, the third is growing, meaning we should each consider growing some of our own food. I know a lot of us, especially attorneys, are quite busy. And as an author and a podcaster and a speaker, I'm also often quite busy. And so it's not necessarily that we each have to be a farmer per se, but uh, many of us have an opportunity to have a little bit of a garden, a little veggie and, and garden, uh, herb garden, perhaps uh, boxes in the windows or even some indoor plants that we're growing that uh, include some herbs we can put in our salads and that sort of thing. And speaking of herbs and salads, the recommendation for more vegetables, especially leafy greens, really can't be overemphasized. Uh, you'll see that little uh, uh, image off to the right. That's the chlorophyll molecule. And it turns out the chlorophyll molecule is almost identical to the hemoglobin molecule in our blood. And of course, chlorophyll is the uh, amazing molecule within uh, green plants that is responsible for photosynthesizing the inbound sunlight into sugars and kicking off the entire uh, food soil carbon cycle that we all rely upon here on the planet earth and so leafy greens vegetables very important not only for the planet but also for our own health and well-being um, and then there's beverages. Of course, a lot of water is critical to our health and wellness. And if we're interested in something other than water, the opportunity to drink more herbal teas instead of sugary drinks, sodas, et cetera, is gonna literally enhance our health and wellness while also uh, helping to support the herbal tea companies, the herbal uh, medicine growers who are making their livings, providing those really important plants and medicines for us. Uh, when it comes to our food choices day in and day out, again, with a very busy life, there's an opportunity to engage in some batch cooking over the weekend or whatever so that we have easy to heat and eat leftovers throughout the week. And of course, as we'll talk about a little later with the packaging recommendations, to the extent we're able, we can choose to avoid single use takeout packaging. This is another way we can take more responsibility for our impact on the planet. And of course, when we're thinking about our teas and our water and so on, reusable glass or stainless steel water bottles is way preferable than the single use disposable, especially plastic in which a lot of us are uh, unfortunately getting our water every day. Now, uh, avoiding plastic is important. And this brings up things like single use straws and you can bring your own and um, carry perhaps to go where I brought a little uh, show and tell here. This is my bamboo to go where I keep it in my automobile. I've got fork, knife, spoon, straw, even chopsticks. And uh, so I don't particularly enjoy eating with plastic utensils myself. This is not only a matter of impacts on the planet, it's also a matter of my own personal preferences and enjoyment and uh, the aesthetics of living. So um, the to go where is a wonderful uh, recommendation. And we've got partnerships with different organizations, including one called Earth Hero. I'll talk toward the end here about uh, a discount opportunity if you're interested in picking any of these things up for yourself. And yeah, just emphasizing the hemoglobin chlorophyll connection with the, uh, the green plants. This is so essential for the alkalinity of our bodies and the overall mineralization and, and nutri nutrition uh, and nourishment of our bodies, our minds, and our even uh, emo emotional endocrine experiences. So here's a quick link for the uh, Earth Hero discount. You can go to whyonearth.org partners and supporters page to get to them and others who are offering special uh, discounts for you right now. The second category, uh, indoor environments, this is a, a great opportunity that often gets overlooked. 
And some of you are probably aware that uh, in many cases, our indoor air quality can actually be worse than the air quality outside, um, which in some of the cities might come as a bit of a surprise. And there are a number of plants that are easy to grow indoors that are extraordinary in their ability to clean and filter the air. And spider plants, which you see here pictured, uh, Chlorophytum commosum is the Latin name, are the top of the heap, the sort of special forces of cleaning air. And so in your home, uh, in your office, there's even research showing their ability to help mitigate electromagnetic uh, pollution from all of our devices. I highly encourage you guys to get spider plants and others to help with the indoor air quality. Of course, if we're uh, doing any painting or finishing, selecting carpets and flooring or furniture for our offices or our homes, choosing the low and no uh, VOC volatile organic compound products is going to help with all of this as well. Not only the health of ourselves, our family, our children, our pets, but also the broader impacts on the environment are affected here are these choices and of course uh to the extent we're able to having plenty of natural daylight and plenty of natural materials is going to a enhance our own personal well-being and that of our friends and colleagues and also have better impacts on the environment when we have more natural daylight for example we don't need to have as much electric powered lighting uh, in our spaces and then if you're in places that are uh, generally hot and especially hot and dry water features can not only add a nice aesthetic quality but can also help with passive indoor cooling of the space the third category clothing textiles and laundry uh, brings me to a few of my favorites um, one is opting for natural materials uh, organic when possible we're seeing more and more cost competitive uh, brands out there sharing cotton wool bamboo that are organically and or regeneratively grown and produced. And one of the real challenges we're facing and learning a lot more about right now in the, especially the arena of plastics loading in the ocean uh, has to do with not just plastic waste in the coastal communities, but also uh, microfiber plastic coming from our laundry, actually. I'm here in Colorado on a regenerative farm outside of Boulder and Denver, Colorado. And most of my friends and colleagues right here don't think of us as being close to the ocean. But when it comes to our discharges from our laundry, our uh, bathrooms, our kitchen sinks, etc., a lot of that actually is flowing right into the ocean via our streams and rivers. So this is another arena where we're invited to think about these interconnected systems that we're all participating in and part of. Of course, also when it comes to clothing, textiles and the like, uh, to choose higher quality over quantity is another opportunity that we have. And certainly different brands, different companies will have varying levels of quality. So when we're thinking about price point, it's, I think, quite important to also think about quality and durability when we're assessing the value of something we're choosing to purchase. And then finally, when we're done, you know, and have gently worn clothes, instead of throwing them in the trash where they might uh, contribute to additional greenhouse gas loading, uh, we can instead donate or consign those so that others in the community, perhaps who aren't uh, quite as fortunate in terms of disposable incomes, have the opportunity to utilize those as well and get a lot more out of the fibers that were uh, manufactured into the clothing for us. So the fourth category is one of my very favorite, soil connection. And this might surprise you a bit and, and seem to be a bit counterintuitive. Um, and, and really, the term counterintuitive strikes me as a little bit funny because I'm not sure this is really a matter of intuition. It's more a matter of habituation, awareness, and education. And over the last several years and decades, having collaborated with a number of regenerative farmers and scientists and others in the space, I've come to understand that our direct connection with soil is actually really critical for our health and wellness. And so with gardening, the first recommendation here, whether it's extensive, whether it's flowers or vegetables or herbs for the kitchen, or even potted plants on the patio, the balcony, or inside our homes, this direct, literal, physical connection with the soil uh, is known now through our scientific studies over the last couple decades to enhance our serotonin production, our experience of joy, even our stress relief, 
and our immune system function, and, and would you believe it, even our cognitive performance. This is because the in healthy living soils, there is a vast uh, community of microbiology of one handful often will have billion plus organisms. And many of those are small enough to pass through our porous skin membranes and actually get into our bloodstream where they have these different effects on our bodies and on our experiences. Um, composting is one of the number one things we can do with our food waste, our kitchen scraps to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. When we choose to put all of those plant-based biodegradable uh, kitchen scraps in the trash and they go to a landfill and get covered up, what typically happens is they go into a process of anaerobic decomposition, which basically releases methane, a very small chemical, uh, CH4, um, that it easily slips up through the membranes and the daily cover of the landfills and gets into the atmosphere and is a very potent greenhouse gas, some 20 to 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So uh, on the one hand, we want to avoid putting these compostable, decomposable food scraps into the trash. And on the other hand, compost them because instead they go into a an aerobic decomposition process with the microbiome and actually contribute to building soil, which enhances the virtuous cycle with plants and trees of carbon sequestration through those uh, green plants process of growing and pulling carbon from the atmosphere and putting it in the ground, we like to say where it belongs. Having house plants is another way. When we're in our gardens, our yards, our neighborhoods, having more pollinator habitat is really important. For those of you who might be following it, our invertebrates, our insects, our pollinators are in dire situation all around the world. And the more habitat, chemical-free, safe habitat we have for them, the better. I mentioned the soil building and how important it is. And if you're looking to dive even more deeply, you might look into using biodynamic and per permacultural and other techniques and strategies in your yard, your neighborhood, your community. Uh, when it comes to the carbon cycle, just a real quick uh, point of information for you guys. Um, since the beginning of the industrial revolution we have increased the co2 concentration in the atmosphere well over 40 percent and if you were to think of this in terms of uh car uh, tr train cars rail cars full of coal imagine a train uh, holding just coal that has so much coal so many cars it would wrap around the equator of the earth over 1,000 times, 1,017 times. Now, these figures are actually a few years old now. This was pre-COVID 2019. So just in the few years since then, uh, actually since 2016, we've seen another 5% increase in atmospheric carbon loading. So we know there's much to be done, much that we need to do to reduce the carbon loading of the atmosphere and actually pull carbon out and sequester it. And this simple image uh, in the middle here shows how this is happening with the plants and the trees and we can contribute to these virtuous cycles of natural carbon sequestration at scale and it turns out that increasing soil carbon by 10 percent a mere 10 percent worldwide is equivalent to sequestering all of the carbon we've released into the atmosphere since the beginning of the industrial revolution just to put it into context and to provide a bit of scope for our opportunity, our challenge, our call to action as a human family worldwide, 10% increase in soil carbon. So this also brings me to one of my other favorite uh, etymological tidbits, which is the term humus from the Latin, the Proto-Indo-European, connected, of course, to our word human, as well as our words humor and humility. And I think there's something really important in that direct connection. And again, getting our hands in the soil is is such a powerful way for us to reduce stress enhance our cognitive function etc the wele and the Adama keywords i'd love to get into those uh perhaps toward the end as well in the q a uh, but to keep things moving along here i want to get to category number five packaging and paper choices and of course avoiding single-use plastic packaging as i mentioned is is key um, using compostable bags for produce instead of plastic bags. These are compostable bags I use from time to time. But typically, if I'm planning to get a bunch of produce, I, I actually use a reu reusable netting like this bag. Uh, and these are all products you can easily find at Earth Hero and elsewhere. Um, I also very much like these glass-based uh, 
reusable containers. Tupperware is what we've come to call these. Of course, that's the brand name. Um, this one's actually Snapware. So we've got a lot of great options nowadays in terms of different packaging that we can use ourselves. And of course, when possible, buy in, in bulk or buy in greater quantities so that the packaging per unit of meal, if you will, is reduced. Um, and, and especially when we're avoiding the single use takeaway packaging, unless it's biodegradable and we're seeing more and more of this out there in restaurants and other venues, um, we want to especially avoid styrofoam. This is something that uh, states and municipalities are actually enacting through law uh, banning uh, because of the environmental impacts and impacts on health. Uh, so these are all choices we can make as we're choosing where to do lunch or dinner, or brec breakfast, brunch, whatever it is. Of course, we can choose recycled hemp and bamboo based uh, paper towels and toilet paper instead of uh, tree based. This is another opportunity that we have. Um, an acre of hemp, for example, produces many factors more usable pulp than an acre of tree produces. And this is assessed over the life cycle of um, fast growing pulping trees. So many years hemp produces much, much more usable material for us. And many of us are aware that much of the uh, materials, the fibers, the cordage, et cetera, that we were using in the 19th century and before that was hemp based. Um, I, I believe the either the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence may also be on hemp. I, don't quote me on that though. That, I don't want to get that wrong. And of course, uh, with our various uh, billing statements for utilities, et cetera, we can choose electronic instead of uh, printed paper options. So number six, the nature connection. This is really quite one of my favorite. You may have even seen today in the uh, either Washington Post or New York Times was an article about how uh, exercising outdoors instead of indoors actually has additional ancillary benefits for our health and wellness. So something to consider there. And when we go to the woods and connect with a tree, this may sound corny, but I really encourage folks, especially executives and professionals to befriend a tree. And there is something very special that occurs when we create that direct relationship. We might recall something like this from our childhood, but I imagine uh, many of us may be out of practice now in our busy adult years. Um, there's a Japanese tradition called Shinrin Yoku, which is known as forest bathing. And the practice literally is to walk into the woods, find a nice spot to sit down and just sit there for a while and just observe and take in and listen and feel and smell all the goings on with the insects, the critters, the birds, the trees, the plants, etc. And beautifully, we have ample uh, scientific research showing how these practices substantially reduce stress and reduce stress hormones in our blood, which for many of us is perhaps one of the biggest health uh, issues and vectors that we have to manage for ourselves. And so walking outside in nature, whether it's a park or a forest, is also giving us the health, the cognitive, the stress reduction, and the immune system benefits, um, and, and is literally helping to mitigate the acceleration of aging that is happening, especially to us who are sitting so much in our work. I'm one of those. Um, and I understand through research I did for the book, Why on Earth, that the American Medical Association recently announced that in the United States, in the aggregate, we're seeing worse impacts from prolonged sitting in our population than we're now seeing from cigarette smoking. Now that there might be some good news, silver lining in that, that the cigarette smoking's down, but this prolonged sitting is actually a, a very significant uh, source of physical maladies for many of us, something to consider. Yeah, so this relationship with mother, mother nature, again, as corny as it may sound, is imperative. And more and more scholars and researchers our understanding that our connection in nature, even visually looking at forests, is essential for our prolonged health and well-being. Some of you may be, have heard of nature deficit disorder. This is now considered real within the scientific community, the psychological and community services arenas. It's important that we're connecting with nature. So number seven, transportation, of course, walk, right? Uh, how many of us uh, could benefit from a little more walking in our days? And I imagine some of us are using devices like Fitbits, et cetera, to even measure our daily walking uh, successes. 
And uh, one of the things I love to mention is joining the Far Away Club. So I imagine some of us, when we go shopping on the weekend or what have you, might drive to the store and feel like, yes, we've won if we get that parking space right up next to the door. But really, what have we won other than uh, missing out on another couple hundred steps that we could have taken at that moment by parking at the far end of the parking lot? So a very simple hack, so to speak, that you can incorporate pretty easily. Of course, enjoying things like public transportation and carpooling from time to time or perhaps regularly is another set of opportunities that we have. And if you're in the market for a vehicle, you might consider a hybrid, an electric vehicle or a super efficient vehicle uh, with your next vehicle purchase or leasing. So number eight, power usage. Yeah, you know, turn off the lights when they're not in use. Um, many of us can maybe recall our our parents encouraging us to do this or have uh, inculcated this into our own children. This is important and a good practice. I think it's also an opportunity to feel a little bit more gratitude for all of the comforts and technology we get to rely on day in and day out. Most of us, at least in this country, uh, don't have too much in the way of rolling brownouts and blackouts and energy supply disruptions. Typically, we get that from time to time with storms, etc. But typically, we uh, can pretty well rely on our energy in this country. And of course, uh, we can reduce our energy usage by using uh, energy efficient light light bulbs. One other thing you might not have thought of is washing our clothes on cold cycle instead of warm or hot reduces energy loading. And it actually in most cases also means we're going to get less wear and tear with our clothes and get more use out of the clothes before we uh, downcycle them, donate them, uh, consign them, what have you. And so finally, when it comes to the laundry again, we can choose to air dry our laundry um, using that great thermal nuclear power plant that we all rely on, also known as the sun uh, and wind. And if we're living in dry climates where it gets hot or, or regardless of temperature, really where we're living in dry climates um, by uh, air drying our laundry indoors, we can actually help to humidify our indoor spaces this way. So water usage, this is another one of my very favorites, and there's a lot we can do here, including um, using non-toxic biodegradable and organic soaps, shampoos and conditioners, lotions, etc. And, you know, I often joke, how many of us in the morning before work might jump in the shower and lather up with some form of uh, potentially even carcinogenic, uh, maybe less expensive, but potentially toxic soap and shampoo and then rinse that off and jump out and dry off and then suddenly we're putting on lotions and other things that might also be uh, not very good for us or the environment in terms of their toxicity profiles. Um, and there are a number of organizations that have provided extensive research on all of this. I encourage you to check out our podcast. I'll speak to that at the end. We've interviewed a number of folks on that front. Also important is using the same non-toxic biodegradable and organic dish detergents, cleaning products, even garden and lawn products. Uh, this is another way we're affecting water uh, through our different effluent streams. And of course, in terms of conserving water, we can use low flow shower heads and faucet attachments, especially in the more arid regions this is increasingly important. And in our gardens outside our yards, we can use drip irrigation, gray water, and even rainwater catchment, especially in arid climates. And the rainwater catchment, interestingly, if any of you are following the uh, Colorado River water compact uh, challenges that we're facing in the West, um, different states actually have different rules and regulations regarding water catchment off of our roofs. And some of us worked here in Colorado to change our framework a few years ago. So you might need to check into your local rules and regulations on water catchment, but we have a number of different water efficient strategies for our gardens and our yards. And finally, community stewardship, which is yet another of my very favorites. In addition to the things we can choose in our daily habits, there's also a lot we can do connecting with others. We can join in community tree planting efforts, gardening efforts, soil building gatherings, if you're not a member of a community garden and you'd like to be, it's a wonderful way to connect with folks. And of course, we can support nonprofits that are engaged in the social and environmental stewardship work, especially those that are working at the local level with school gardens, community gardens, tree planting efforts, et cetera. And at those community gathering uh, sessions, we have the opportunity to connect more with people outside of our immediate demographic and affinity and neighborhood groups, which 
is another way we can enhance and enrich our quality of life, learn from others, come to understand other perspectives, perhaps even understand other ways we can help people in our communities. And this is also a call to action to consider engaging more in stewardship philanthropy. Uh, many of us are uh, stressed by our money, our earnings, our spending, our savings, our retirement, our future. But I think it's important to step back and consider that globally speaking, all of us are so very well off. And I was just sharing with my son, who's uh, a junior in undergraduate school studying architecture and environmental design, that something like six or seven percent of people worldwide um, have a college education. So it's something to really keep in perspective, the blessings we have uh, the opportunities for feeling and expressing gratitude and the opportunities we have to help others who aren't quite as fortunate. And this sense of ethos of ethics brings me to one of my very favorite slides. When we look at the global systems, whether we're thinking about energy and climate, we're thinking about water and soil and food, we're thinking about chemicals and toxin loadings throughout the environments and in our own bodies, you know, we're seeing a lot of interconnected systemic risks. And there's this easy temptation, especially if we're you know, busy with our professions and not necessarily paying attention to all of the emerging science and understanding around this, that uh, we, we can think that we're not really ourselves at so much danger. And this slide with this boat out in the middle of the water, no land in sight, is a, is a really great way to depict with a little bit of humor something that's really not that funny, that so many of our fellow brothers and sisters around the planet are dealing with extremely challenging situations and really need our help. And so the guys at the high end of the boat here are saying sure glad the hole isn't at our end right and i think the uh, the message the implication here is probably pretty clear to most of us so we have a choice and in taking better care of ourselves our environment and each other in our communities we truly have a, a profound opportunity to affect the immediate the near-term mid-term and long-term futures of our own experiences and those of our kids, grandkids, and the generations to come. To conclude before the q and I I wanna just mention that we've got several resources for you. Um, along the bottom here are images of the various books that I've written. Uh, the one in the middle called The Biggest Deal, you may notice says forthcoming underneath it. This is a book on regenerative finance, social enterprise, stewardship, philanthropy, and ecocene economics that I'm writing and for which we've invited a handful of VIP thought leaders to contribute essays like John Perkins, Hunter Lovins, David Corton, um, Ruby Ao, Tom Chi at At One Ventures in the Bay Area. You may know about Tom's work. He's deployed over $100 million into sustainability technologies and many others. Um, so that's going to be a great resource. On the left is Why on Earth? Uh, the subtitle is Get Smarter, Feel Better, Heal the Planet. And for you guys, with our special gathering today, we put together uh, an offering where you can get all of these um, in ebook form for free using the discount code gratis at whyonearth.org. Just go to the store section, you'll see the books there. Um, so Why on Earth, Veriditas, my new eco thriller novel that gets even more deeply into the biodynamics mm -hmm. and regenerative um, practices, the nature connection. The main character is a super smart computer scientist and entrepreneur, and she has to flee New York City, kind of like a Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code, energetic, and flees out west to Colorado. A lot of the story takes place in Colorado. That's available as an ebook. So is our Soil Stewardship Handbook. This is the simple down and dirty intro to soil stewardship. And then we have a series of children's books, celebrating water, celebrating soil, celebrating honeybees. In each story, it's brother and sister and their ethnicities change from book to book. So you can get all those in ebook uh, format for free with the code gratis. Why on Earth is also available as an audiobook, which you can also get for free. And then if you want any of these in printed form, you can get a 10% discount right now using the code WSGR. We put that together just for you guys. And of course, I want to mention the podcast, which you can find on the website, whyonearth.org. We've had the opportunity to interview a variety of thought leaders, some on the global stage, like David Beasley, who just stepped down as the executive director of the United Nations World Food Program, which of course was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize a couple years ago under his leadership. Kate Williams, the CEO of 1% for the Planet, General Wesley Clark, uh, both David and Michael Bronner from Dr. Bronner's, um, Elizabeth Whitlow, the executive director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance. I mentioned Tom Chi at One Ventures, he's on there. Dr. Jandell Allen Davis, she's doing amazing work um, and is on the uh, Federal Reserve Board in uh, Kansas City, Hunter Lovins, John Liu, 
uh, Dr. Robert Cloninger, uh, extraordinary medical doctor and uh, psychiatrist doing work out of St. Louis. Lots of wonderful folks to uh, listen to and learn from on the podcast for you as well. And then finally, if any of you want to connect with me directly, here's my email. It's Aaron at whyonearth.org. Happy to uh, connect. And uh, with that, just to summarize the opportunities that we have with all of these uh, daily choices and habit uh, changing steps that we can take basically can be summarized in five or six key uh, topics. One is decarbonizing energy. One is recarbonizing soil. One is detoxifying our environments in the big sense of oikos. The other is detoxifying our homes, the more immediate sense of oikos, and then regenerating ecosystems. These are the actions that we can take. And the Why on Earth community, the nonprofit, is an action-oriented educational nonprofit, so we like taking actions. And of course, Again, this might sound corny to some of you, but I ask you to at least consider this for the next day or two. The more that we're each cultivating love, compassion, and kindness in all that we're doing, perhaps is also key to not only healing the ecosystems and bringing balance back to the planetary systems like the climate and atmosphere and water, uh, but also to bring greater joy, prosperity, happiness, and quality of life to ourselves, our families, and the communities in which we're all connected. So with that, uh, I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions, if any of you have any. Again, a huge thanks to Wilson Sonsini, all of you for your time and attention today, and a special thanks to Tomas and Leah and Austin for inviting me and uh, helping to facilitate this conversation today. Hi, Aaron. We do have a question in the chat for you. I'll read it off right now. Uh, for composting, those of that that live in apartments without outdoor space can struggle with how best to dispose of compostable waste. Any recommendations on how to compost living in an apartment? Thank you. That's a really good question. And we actually get this question quite often. Um, first of all, we have a lot of work to do at our municipal levels and even in the uh, housing uh, complexes and neighborhoods where we live. Right now, some of our colleagues, we have an ambassador network, by the way, that you can email me if you're interested in. We are preparing a handbook to help uh, housing communities, HOAs, et cetera, um, to take the steps that allow folks to more easily compost, um, to sort of get past the superficial appearance kind of thinking around landscaping and prosperity and wellness well-being that word wele by the way that i mentioned with the etymology is middle english and it's the same word that we get the word wealth from and the word well-being from wellness um, so we're re uh, establishing what we mean by wealth in this work and we we have um we're putting these resources together to help folks in apartment complexes condo complexes homeowners associations to make the kinds of changes that need to be made. And when you have um, multi-unit dwelling uh, structures, it's a great opportunity to have a shared compost bin. Um, you can also work at the municipal level to set up municipal composting that's much like a trash or recycling service. There's a lot that can be done and uh, it perhaps requires of some of us or at least offers some of us the opportunity to lean in a bit and engage a bit to help make some of those systemic changes. And if you'd like to connect with us to help uh, this more broadly with these, uh, this handbook and these resources we're putting together, please do reach out. Thank you for that question. It's really important. By the way, if none of those options are available to you, there are some in-vessel um, kitchen scale, under the sink scale, uh, worm composting um, devices that you can get. They do require a little bit of maintenance. There are some other devices that are perhaps a little less maintenance. Um, so there are options, especially for those of us that are in the more urban settings. And many of us uh, may be living in high density situations where there's a, a community garden not too terribly far away. And often you'll see uh, compost bins uh, there or compost piles. So, you know, once a week, you know, keep things in the fridge so they don't stink, whatever. You can uh, go out and, and enjoy a little walk through the community garden and maybe meet a new friend when you're there, too. And perhaps you might even hear some birds chirping as well. Thank you so much, Aaron.
If anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask Aaron directly. Hi, Aaron. Um, my name is Julia. I actually have a question about packaging. Do you know if there are any initiatives on holding grocery stores or producers responsible for their own plastic packaging and being able to take produce or whatever it is that's packaged and bringing it into your own reusable storage? Thank you. Great question. Um, yes, there, there are a whole number of initiatives nationwide and even internationally. Uh, much of this is being done at the municipal level. Um, here in Colorado, we actually had a handful of municipalities over the last few years uh, either impose a uh, small tax on uh, single-use plastic bags and so on, uh, or uh, ban them outright. And, and just in the last year or two our, at the state level, uh, we've created a ban so that we're basically phasing out the use of single-use uh, plastic bags. I think there's been some really good um, progress and innovation in this arena on the West Coast as well. I haven't been tracking this comprehensively, so I can't give uh, the full picture answer, but definitely am aware of many success stories. And uh, I think there's plenty of opportunity again here for uh, each of us to lean in and do even more in the other communities where perhaps we're not not quite as far along yet. And yeah, one of my favorites um, is my reusable grocery bags. These bundle up so easily. I'm showing you on screen here. And uh, so I can easily keep a few of these in my car. And when I run into the store, I've got bags ready to go. So they're they're not the big bulky ones. I don't particularly like those. They're They're very easy to use and compact easy to tuck away. So we do have options. And in many of our communities, we have more work to do. Thank you for that question. Yeah. And then just going off that briefly, like, let's say you're buying butter lettuce and it comes in a plastic container. Do you think there will ever be, ever be a day that we can take it out of the plastic container and make the grocery store be responsible for recycling and handling the plastic they provide us as consumers? Yeah, it's another really great question. And uh, I'm actually very fascinated by packaging and materials generally. Um, one of the chapters in Why on Earth is called Make and gets into all our manufactured materials and identifies some of the really exciting emerging trends. I'm sure some of you are tracking this with some of your clients where we're shifting from uh, petroleum-based plastics into bio-based and biodegradable uh, polymers that behave like plastics and also uh, things like uh, fungus-based uh, um, packaging that is even more rapidly uh, biodegradable. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled and optimistic that we're seeing some, some rapid advances in the packaging arena presently. Also, in terms of holding various parties in these value chains and supply chains accountable, there is uh, quite a bit of interesting emerging work being done uh, not only for things like uh, plastic packaging but also for um, higher value dur durable goods like automobiles and so on and it seems that a lot of this is uh, in in process I, I'm not personally aware that we've got a, a whole bunch of success stories assigning uh, responsibility to one particular party in the value chain I'm sure some of you might actually have more awareness on this than I do but uh, we, we certainly have plenty of work to do. And uh, what's been done here in Colorado, I think is, is a great example of what can be done elsewhere. Um, and yeah, it's regardless of where we're at in terms of the, the governance, the rules, the regulations, and the uh, stores taking responsibility themselves, of course, there's a lot we can each do in our own decision making. I personally love when I go shopping, I love going to uh, natural grocers, it's called. They're in many states and they have an entirely organic produce section and most of the produce is not in packaging. So I, I get a kick out of filling my cart with as much organic produce without any plastic packaging as I can. And then I carry it home in these bags and shake them out and get them ready for the next round, you know, several days out. So uh, I, I appreciate the question. There's a whole lot we can do in this arena, and uh, it's pretty exciting in terms of how we're seeing the uh, packaging materials evolve so rapidly right now. Hi, Aaron. We have another question in the chat here for you. 
the attendee wanted to revisit the options for eliminating single-use plastics. They have small kids and find it really difficult to keep them from having a million snacks a day with single-use packaging. Yeah, this is this is a great point. Um, my kids are a bit older now, so I recall the days. One of the things I didn't grab out of my uh, kitchen over here is a foldable beeswax um, coated uh, cloth that you can wrap sandwiches with. You can wrap up chopped vegetables or fruit or whatever and use it over and over again. Simple rinse off in the sink when you're done. And so there are a whole bunch of uh, packaging options that are great for the young ones. Um, again, I would recommend going to Earth Hero. You can get to them through our website and they're doing a 15% discount right now on everything for Earth Month. They've got all kinds of great uh, resources for that too. So I would really encourage folks, I know it might sound like it's going to add, a, you know, a little extra work, but um, you might consider uh, getting some things in bulk and chopping or divvying up into those uh, reusable packaging solutions instead of buying you know it's it's wild some of the ways we see the single use wrapped and packaged in plastic and that's bundled with some more wrapped in plastic and if you're buying a bunch of those in a a, a bulk offer or whatever even that might be wrapped a third time in plastic and so certainly we have tremendous power in our consumer choices one of the things i love about getting into the microeconomics of the food industry in particular is that many of the stakeholders in the food value chain supply chains are operating on quite thin margins and so as we as consumers shift our behavior it doesn't take too many of us before the impact is felt on the bottom lines and the balance sheets of the companies and and they respond as we're increasingly data oriented in our uh, grocery and food supply chains, those, those companies are responding more and more. There's a reason Walmart's the biggest purveyor of organic foods in the country. Um, that's because more and more people wanted organic foods. So there's quite a lot that we can do. And I appreciate the question, especially for us as parents and busy professionals. Um, we, we've got a, a lot of conveniences out there that might seem to make life a little easier in the immediate term, but aren't necessarily what we want to be doing uh, for the kids in the future and so on. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. Does anyone else have any other questions for Aaron? All right. I also don't see any other messages in the chat, so I think that should be it. Thank you so much for presenting today for us, Aaron. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, everybody. And uh, yeah, please reach out if you'd like to connect. Take care, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Month. Happy Earth Year, Happy Earth Century.